It's my nerd world, and welcome to it, a Star Wars podcast. Glad you're with the show this week. On the show this week, John Boyega, star of the sequel trilogy, plays the character Finn, does an interview with British GQ, and dozens upon dozens of articles are spawned from it. I'm going to trepidatiously wade into the waters of the John Boyega interview and share my thoughts. Up front, I'm going to be honest, I disagree with what he had to say. And I will explain in detail why. Also on the show this week, an interesting observation going all the way back to the movie that started it all, an Obi-Wan Kenobi in A New Hope. Something that I myself hadn't even considered, and I'll be sharing it with you on the show this week. Also, got some listener feedback we'll dive into, talkshownerd at gmail.com. This portion of the show is brought to you by... The Embark space opera science fiction series all Taft wanted to do was to impress Katha. He never expected that he'd have to save humanity to do it. Embark is a relevant and fresh take on the classic space opera space opera genre, if I can speak correctly. Available right now in paperback, uh, ebook, and uh, audiobook at Amazon.com or at MyNerdWorld.net. And this week we are starting a brand new contest, your opportunity to pick up free audiobooks of the Embark Science Fiction Space Opera Trilogy. I'll give you some details on that a little bit later on in the show. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. Calling to you. My nerd road. Just fed it in. It is a Star Wars podcast, and I am your host, John Justice. I'm so glad you're with the show again this week. As always, you can email talkshownerd at gmail.com. Talkshownerd at gmail.com. I don't know what is going on with The Mandalorian. <laughs> We have not received the trailer yet. We did get earlier this week, and it's the one little news item that I want to share with you before we dive into the controversial waters that are John Boyega and his comments to the British GQ. And, and I'm going to explain exactly why I'm going to be talking about it on the show, because I really wrestled with the idea of making this the core topic um, this week. But uh, I feel like there's some things that need to be said, and um, I have an opinion. I have quite a few opinions about what John, jo uh, John Boyega had to say, and uh, to be quite honest with you, I disagree with uh, his interpretation of the portrayal of Finn in these movies, and that's how, how I'll be approaching this particular topic. It's going to be from a fan of this franchise and a fan of the, of the character Finn as it relates to the comments that John Boyega has made about his experiences working on on the film. Uh, plus, we'll dive into this uh, really interesting nugget that's kind of been making the rounds. Overlooked Obi-Wan Kenobi death detail is suddenly leaving Star Wars fans shook. The uh, version that I have of this uh, comes from movie, uh, movie Web, and we'll share that with you. Details about the audiobook Embark giveaway. And uh, listener feedback a little bit later on in the in the show. So just one quick note on the Mandalorian. Uh, no idea when we're getting the the full trailer for that. We got to be getting close. It it debuts on October thirtieth, and that was the little bit of information that came out this week. The other thing that came along with the announcement that the Mandalorian would be debuting on Disney Plus on October thirtieth was the reveal of the new logo. Now, the new logo is very much like the original logo, where it has Star Wars, the Mandalorian. And within the letters, there's an image, right? And it's of the Mandalorian in a landscape. This particular logo, though, has the addition of the child, Chaloda, in the logo. But more specifically, and I'm reading a lot into this, it's blue. And why is that significant? Well, that's significant, in my opinion, because of my theory that Jon Favreau is going to be crafting seasons one, two, and three in terms of feel and style and tone the same way that the original trilogy played out. So Mandalorian Season 1 is akin to A New Hope. Mandalorian Season 2 will be akin to The Empire Strikes Back. And Mandalorian Season 3 will be akin to Return of the Jedi. 
So what does blue come into this? Well, blue comes into this because the the original Manda, uh, uh, Mandalorian logo was more of that yellow sort of brown. That's a little bit more indicative of the the the, the color palette that we uh, are used to when it comes to a New Hope. Blue is definitely linked to the Empire Strikes Back. The original promotion and a lot of the continuing promotion around the Empire Strikes Back has always been blue logos. Uh, going right back to that original teaser that I saw as a kid sitting on the shag carpet in, in my home in Southern California in the 80s. And that blue logo, you know, Star Wars, the Empire Strikes Back, stylized in blue with Vader's helmet came up on screen. So I'm making a big jump, but based off of the logo, it's the first little indication that I might be correct when it comes to my theory about how the Mandalorian is going to play out. That's really the only like specific news item that came out this week. So let's dive into the controversy. This is not going to go the way you think. The version of the article from GQ that I have talking about this comes from Wired Magazine. I also went into the GQ article and pulled out some of the other quotes that the Wired article didn't cover and an expansion on some of these quotes. So the Wired version of the article, the headline is this. John Boyega is right about Star Wars. Okay. I wrote in my own sub-headline, and my own sub-headline to this was, like Obi-Wan Kenobi says, it really depends on your point of view. So in the Wired article, they say this, and I did some editing for the sake of time. Remember the first time you saw Star Wars The Force Awakens, or even the trailer for Star Wars The Force Awakens? Do you recall thinking, I think that Finn guy, the stormtrooper who defected, I think he's going to be a big deal. The Star Wars universe loves it when heroes come from relative obscurity and do the brave thing. Uh, like, say, help the Resistance pilot escape the First Order. Finn, it seemed, was destined for great things. John Boyega, the actor who plays Finn, thought so too. But he doesn't anymore. In an interview published this week with British GQ, Boyega says that while Daisy Ridley's Ray and Adam Driver's Kylo Ren got full nuanced story arcs, characters like Finn and Rose Tico were sidelined by the finale in The Rise of Skywalker. He says, and I do that thing with my fingers, you get yourself involved in projects and you're not necessarily going to like everything, he told the magazine. But what I would say to Disney is not to bring out a black character, market them to be much more important in the franchise than they are, and then have them push to the side. It's not good. I'll say it straight up. You knew what to do with these other people, but when it came to Kelly Marie Tran and when it came to John Boyega, you know F all. No, I'm going to address the Kelly Marie, uh, Marie Tran angle of this a little bit later on in my in my comments. Because I think lumping in Kelly Marie Tran into this larger discussion and controversy and comment about whether or not Finn's character was treated appropriately, specifically as it related to the promotional materials, is a little unfair. Kelly Marie Tran was introduced in the second film, not as one of the main three characters of the franchise. And when we get into The Rise of Skywalker, there needs to be some conversation about what happens with Kelly Marie Tran. How do you make that character bigger in the larger story without dismissing some of the other newer characters that were introduced that also became very important to the story, especially if you're looking at diversity? And I'm talking about Janna. So I'll get back to the Kelly Marie Tran issue a little bit later on. As far as John Boyega's comments are concerned, and I want to approach this specifically from a fan of the franchise and what is on screen versus what John Boyega is saying in public. I am not going to presume, nor should I, what it feels like to be John Boyega. Okay, he is obviously 100% entitled to his opinion and viewpoint. We all are. Okay? And I will not... You know, that's not at all what I want to do or say. I don't presume to be, you know, in John Boyega's shoes. He's not talking in the article about being treated inappropriately, right? Being treated inappropriately as an actor on set. That's not. This is all about his portrayal of the character and how other people wrote the character. This is my perspective and opinion and perception of his comments as a fan of this franchise. And I want to make that clear because this is one of those... Dangerous territories you walk into, especially in the world that we live in, and I know this. I'm, I'm a full-time radio talk show host, and I have been for 24 years. I've had my fair share of controversy, and I can relate to certain aspects of what John Boyega is saying because I, too, have, I've, had to go to, I've had to go to court for people that have 
made death threats against me being a talk show host. I've had people that have wanted me to die, and I've gotten hate mail. I even got some last week and comments on Twitter. So I know I can relate to what that feels like. Just from that angle, obviously. There are many things and most everything else that I cannot relate to as a person because John Boyega is his own person and I am my own, okay? So any expectations that he had of of his character, right? This is what we're talking about. All right, so let's get back into the article. Now, here's the full comment to the one that was in Wired that was from the GQ magazine so we can get a little bit more context on this. Like, you guys knew what to do with Daisy Ridley. You knew what to do with Adam Driver, he says. You knew what to do with these other people. But when it came to Kelly Marie Tran, when it came to John Boyega, you know F all. So what do you want me to say? What they want you to say is, I enjoyed being a part of it. It was a great experience. Nah, nah, nah. I'll take that deal when it's a great experience. They gave all the nuance to Adam Driver, all the nuance to Daisy Ridley. Let's be honest. Daisy knows this. Adam knows this. Everybody knows this. I'm not exposing anything. Now, once I get through his comments here, I'm going to lay out in my view why I disagree with John Boyega. And not only that, but, I mean, disagreeing, and I think he's wrong. Based off of evidence, John Boyega's comments about the character Finn, okay, this is what we're talking about, his perception versus the reality. And I've laid it all out, and I'll share it with you coming up in a bit. Because when you look at the actual storylines and you look at the actual runtimes, that's not true. And this idea that they knew, you know, the nuance of Adam Driver, the nuance of Daisy Ridley, right? They they gave them all this. They knew what they were going to do. They didn't know what they were going to do with the other characters. Again, I'm going to break down how that's not the case. Not to mention the fact that J.J. Abrams, Ryan Johnson, and then J.J. Abrams again, they all had the freedom to decide how the characters were going to move forward. And I'm very much of the opinion that Finn was not done wrong by any stretch of the imagination in the promotional materials or what happens on screen. All right, getting back into the article. One of the many things that got lost in the discourse around the new Star Wars trilogy by the time it reached Rise of Skywalker was what happened to characters like Rose and Finn, whose storylines promised big endings and never delivered. Now, that's a comment by Wired, and that is totally and purely subjective. I never felt that way. I did not walk out of The Last Jedi with any sort of expectations of storylines being any bigger than what they were. Yes, there was some toying with the idea of a potential romance between Finn and Rose Tico. But that was never really established beyond her attempt to save him when he was trying to commit self-sacrifice at the end of The Last Jedi and giving him a slight kiss saying, we're going to save what we love. That was the extent of that. So to say, right, storylines promised big endings and never delivered, that is subjective on on Wired's part. Because me as a fan who's watched these films and going back to the first time, I never had any expectations. As Boyega noted, he's not talking about anything that wasn't already known. He's just saying it out loud. What they want to say to you is, again, I enjoy being a part of a part of it. It's a great experience. Nah, nah, nah. I'll take it when it's a great experience. And that's really unfortunate. I it it bums me out when 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 actors of franchises that I really enjoy suddenly come out and start pushing back against those franchises. I certainly understand it when it's when it's circumstances surrounding, again, being treated unfairly or harsh work environments or a director that's mean or things like this. But that doesn't appear to be the case. This all seems to be John Boyega simply having a beef with the writers and creators of these films in that his character didn't turn out the way that he specifically felt it should turn out. But that wasn't up to him. He's entitled to his opinion. But again, as a fan watching these films, knowing how this works... He's not the writer. He's not the director. And yeah, he's allowed to come out and talk about it later on, but I feel like it's doing a disservice to the fandom and to fans of his specific character that could have been inspired by Finn's story and should be based off of the way he was written. So that's certainly my perception. But if you're a kid or an adult, regardless of your skin color, regardless of your gender, and you were a big fan of Finn... To go and have the actor come out and disparage the character in its portrayal, what a bummer. That's supposed to, is, is that supposed to do more, more good 
Or is that doing more harm than good that could have been done? Getting back into the article, I'm the only cast member, John Boyega went on to say, who had their own unique experience of that franchise based off their race. Now, that is, that is true, but there's a larger point here, he told GQ. It makes you angry. Uh, it makes you angry with a process like that because you realize I've given this opportunity, but I'm in an industry that wasn't ready for me. Nobody else in the cast had people saying they were going to boycott the movie. That's just not true. Because they were in it. Nobody else had the uproar and death threats death threats sent to their Instagram DMs and social media, right? That's not true. Saying black this, black that, you shouldn't be a stormtrooper, okay? That part of it in terms of specificity over the irrational, ludicrous, and hateful comments being made by fans towards him. The specificity is true, but it's not true to say that he was the only one that was dealing with this. Nobody else had that experience, but yet people are surprised I'm this way. That's my frustration. Well, and again, that's not true. And why isn't that true? No, because Kelly Marie Tran got grief too. Kelly Marie Tran got so much grief that she left her Instagram account because there were a bunch of hateful fans out there that didn't like her character and hated The Last Jedi. I was around when the movie was being promoted and subsequently since, and I've been doing podcasts during that whole time. Daisy Ridley as well. How many times has she been called a Mary J? How many different individuals, a uh, 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 Mary Jane? Right? How many different people have done and how many different podcasts have been done talking about how horrible the franchise is and boycott it because of SJW? So I get it. It sucks that John Boyega had that experience, but this is this is one the world that we live in. It's not right by any stretch of the imagination, but this is the reality and the way this game is played now because of social networking. And we've highlighted that on this show time and time again. In the continued afterglow of that first franchise defibrillating Star Wars film, he continued to notice to notice a stylist he'd hired when he first started doing press, cringing at certain clothes I wanted to go for, he said. The hairdresser, who had no experience with working of working with hair like this, uh, but still had the guts to pretend, and he decided that he could no longer grin and bear it like a grateful competition winner. During the press of The Force Awakens, I went along with it, he notes. And obviously, at the time, I was very genuinely happy to be part of it. But my dad always tells me one thing. Don't overpay with, a res- with, with respect. You can pay respect, but sometimes you'll be overpaying and selling yourself short. Now, the interesting thing I have to note in here is that he says specifically a stylist that he'd hired. So this was somebody that John Boyega hired to do this. Now, again, I'm not going to presume I know exactly the experience that he was going through or the uh, the specific clothes that he was trying to wear. But I do have firsthand knowledge of how producers of television shows and stylists and people that are hired to go and do this sometimes know a little bit more about this thing than the individual who's doing the hosting is going to be on camera does. I did CNN a couple of years ago. I was flown to New York City on uh, during the week to sit on a roundtable discussion on a live CNN show uh, with a group of individuals. And I was told by the host of the show that I could wear what I want. You know, I'm dressed nice, but, you know, I want you to be comfortable. So you wear what you want to wear. So I wore a nice pair of of, uh, jeans, uh, a, a nice blazer, and I wore underneath the blazer a nice gray uh, Star Wars T-shirt with a circular uh, white and tan uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi logo on the front. And I was told after that first night from the producers, hey, don't wear printed shirts like that. It doesn't look good on camera. Now, I was told by somebody else to be me. I was told by somebody else to dress how I want to dress and the you know, and, and to, to, to be as genuine as possible. And that's what I was. And then I was told by producers, hey, don't wear that. It doesn't look good on camera. These are all choices that we that we make as people of whether or not you are going to decide to allow yourself to become a victim or not. And in my opinion, John Boyega, again, I want to say this, is entitled to his opinion, but I also feel like he's choosing to be a victim in all that and is to the detriment of the fandom. So let me give you some evidence of this, right? And I'll repeat something I said before. I'm not going to presume I know what John, what it feels like to be John Boyega. That would be wrong to do. That's not at all what I want to say or what I will say. This is my perspective, opinion, and perception of his comments as a fan of this franchise and a fan of that character. Okay? Any expectations that John Boyega had of his character is on him. He had those scripts. He chose to play the roles that he did. And in my opinion, he's doing a lot of disservice to the franchise and to the fans that may have been inspired by his portrayal of Finn. So I'm going to run through all three movies really quick. 
And going back to this idea, right, of they gave nuance to Adam Driver, nuance to, Dave, to Daisy Ridley. Let's be honest. Daisy knows this. Adam knows this. Everybody knows this. I'm not exposing anything, right? What I would say to Disney, it's not good to bring out a black character, market them to be much more important in the franchise than they are, and then have them pushed to the side. It's not good. I'll say that straight up. You knew what you wanted to do with these other people, but when it came to Kelly Marie Tran, when it came to John Boyega, you know F all. Okay, this is why I disagree with that. Let's start with The Force Awakens. The movie opens up, before we even meet Ray, with John Boyega as a part of this, as that stormtrooper, right, on Jakku. He is central to the story in the movie throughout the entire film, okay? He knew, going into The Force Awakens, that Rey was going to be the centerpiece of the story. Everybody did. She is central on the poster, on the original poster. Kylo Ren, I'm looking at it right now. Kylo Ren is the biggest figure next to Rey. John Boyega is the third, maybe next to Harrison Ford. He's about the same size on the poster. People watching the trailer also knew this. This wasn't any secret. It wasn't any secret that, yeah, that was a bait and switch in those original trailers of him holding the lightsaber. And I remember going back and watching John Boyega, and I think it was his brother, watching the trailer for the first time and freaking out how excited they were to see Finn wielding the lightsaber. He knew the story. So to say that he got sidelined in The, last, in the, in, in the Force Awakens, I don't understand. Let me take this another, another way. He wields the lightsaber in The Force Awakens more than Rey does. It gets handed to him after Rey rejects it on Takodana. He uses it to fight against the Stormtrooper before he's saved by Han Solo, but he does wield that lightsaber. Then he wields it again at the end of the film against Kylo Ren, holds his own, wounds Kylo Ren to the point that that's one of the arguments that you can make as to why Ray was able to beat him after being Kylo Ren. She taps into the Force. It was only because John Boyega stepped up and ended up wounding Kylo in that battle before justifiably being beat by Kylo because John Boyega was a stormtrooper, not a Jedi or anybody who'd used a weapon like the lightsaber before apart from when he wielded it on Taco Donna during the battle at Maz Kanata's castle. He has the lightsaber and uses it more than Rey does in The Force Awakens. I'm sorry, but how can you say that that character was sidelined? Now, let's get into The Last Jedi, which is the one that he seems to have one of the biggest beefs with, although it also seems to have a problem with The Rise of Skywalker. The original opening to The Last Jedi started, if you watch the documentary, started with Finn waking up after, and again, it was J.J. Abrams that took Finn out of commission at the end of The Force Awakens, right? And The Last Jedi, apart from the opening montage and battle with between Hux and between Poe Dameron, right? We see again Finn wake up, and the first thing he asks is, where's Rey? Continuing his arc that started... In The Force Awakens, that arc of his caring for Rey, he is given the side story in The Last Jedi. Look, regardless of whether or not people like the story of what happens with Finn, we completely cut away from Rey, Luke, and Kylo to go on that adventure with Rey, I'm sorry, with Finn and with Rose. It's actually its own separate story. Something that he doesn't get in The Force Awakens or The Rise of Skywalker. He then gets to go one-on-one -on -one in this amazingly choreographed scene with Captain Phasma and takes out one of the bad guys. He continues to get a hero's moment at the end of the film with his attempted self-sacrifice, which brings his character full circle from going to just caring about Rey to actually wanting to help the Resistance, wanting to go out and face Kylo Ren to help Luke Skywalker. You could have pulled everything with Finn and Rose out and like made it its own little story. So to say that they got sidelines, I'm sorry, sidelined, I'm sorry. I sit back and scratch my head and go, um, what are you, are you talking about? And I haven't even gotten into the run times yet. I'll get to that in a moment. Then you get into the Rise of Skywalker. Okay? His role as one of the main characters is great. He gets to lead 
right? The secondary story element at the end on the assault on the Star Destroyers over Exegol. He gets a Luke moment with Janna in taking down the main First Order Star Destroyer at the end, almost giving up his own life to do so. And then Janna and Lando get the heroic uh, moment at the, the end together when the Star Destroyer is crashing back down to the planet Exegol below and Lando blows past Poe Dameron trying to rescue them in his orange X-Wing fighter to say the Millennium Falcon's faster. And now you have these three characters all in their own heroic moment at the end of the film. Now, obviously, that, pays, that plays second to the central storyline of Rey and Kylo Ren, but everybody knew that, including them going into it. So I don't get where John Boyega is coming from, from a specific what is on screen standpoint based off of the comments that he's making. Now, as far as Rose Tico goes, lumping in frustrations about that particular character's involvement is all subjective. She had a great and large role in The Last Jedi. And to give her as big of one in The Rise of Skywalker, you'd probably have to replace Janna. And she, too, played a hugely important role to Finn. That was the point. It wasn't like the relationship between Finn and Rose was developed so much so in The Last Jedi to the point of where everybody just expected those two characters to be boyfriend-girlfriend. That, was, that, that, that wasn't any takeaway that I saw. I mean, if somebody else did, okay, that's cool. But I certainly didn't feel that way. There wasn't any romantic inclinations beyond the moment when Rose saves him at the end on Crate, and she gives him that one peck on the cheek that seemed really more friendly than it was romantic by any stretch of the imagination. So we end up bringing in another strong female black character to the story in The Rise of Skywalker, and she ends up becoming crucial to Finn and his involvement in the assault on the Star Destroyer at the end of the film, and those two individuals are the one that basically have the Luke moment in taking down what was the equivalent of the Death Star from the first movie and the Death Star from Return of the Jedi in terms of equivalency of superweapons. They were the ones, he was the one to shut down the radar. He was the one to then realize they could reboot it and to go and move that gun in that amazingly shot moment and incredible visual effects by J.J. Abrams with the bam, 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 bam. And that gun just takes out the flight deck and destroys General Pride. That was an important role. So, yeah, if you wanted Rose's role to be larger in The Force Awakens, I mean, I'm sorry, in The Rise of Skywalker, then you probably would have had to remove the John, the Jana character. So let's get into a little bit more specificity. I have the runtimes here of all the characters, right? And this idea that John Boyega presents that these characters got sidelined and he got sidelined. Um, in The Force Awakens, Ray's got 43 minutes of screen time. Finn has 31, 45 seconds. Han Solo, 20 minutes and 30 seconds. Ben Solo, Kylo Ren, 19 minutes. So in the first movie... Um, it is Ray and Finn, one and two, in terms of screen time. In The Last Jedi, Ray gets 30 minutes. Luke Skywalker gets 21-15. Finn gets 17 minutes. Ben Solo, Kylo Ren gets 15. Rose Tico gets 13. And Poe Dameron gets 12. Again, Ray, Luke Skywalker, understandably, because the movie's called The Last Jedi. That's him. And then Finn. So again, of the new characters, Finn is second in terms of total screen time in The Last Jedi. The Rise of Skywalker, Ray, 55 minutes, 45 seconds. Poe, 25 minutes, 45 seconds. Finn, 24 minutes, 45 seconds. Kylo Ren, Ben Solo, 20 minutes, 30 seconds. If anybody's going to complain about being sidelined based off of run time, it apparently needs to be Adam Driver. <laughs> now, granted, Poe has a little bit more screen time in... Um, the Rise of Skywalker, but they're also together for a lot of it, right? Okay. So, in total, I added them all up because I have a calculator. Ray's screen time between all three films was 128 minutes. Finn's, 75 minutes. Ben, Kylo Ren, 54 minutes. And Poe, 46 minutes. That's not sidelined. That's co-star. And everybody knew that Ray was going to be the star. Apart from that one teaser trailer 
where for a moment you thought maybe he was going to be the main hero. And essentially he was, you know, she's the star. He was the co-star, the storylines, the run times, the characters all display that. So what does all of this have to say? Why did I bother doing this? Well, I, I, I wanted to do this because it bums me out. It makes me sad. It makes me sad. Because there's opportunities that get lost in circumstances like this. I'll stress again. John Boyega can have whatever thoughts he wants to have. He is obviously entitled to his opinion. And if he didn't like his experience on working on these movies, okay. It's one thing to not like your experience. It's another thing to go and disparage the, the, the creators of this with these types of arguments that when you look at the reality of it, in my opinion, just don't ring true. It sucks that the fandom is that a way that it is. And I'm going to get to this in a moment. But all of this is to say that while he is Finn and he is entitled to his opinion, what is on screen is there for all to see. And from what I see, he's wrong in his disparaging comments about the franchise and his character. Daisy Ridley and Ray were always going to be the star. He knows that. But the idea that he was shoved to the side is just not factually true. He's on screen the second longest next to Ray. Kylo and, and Ben's story is wrapped up in Ray's story. He is the co-star of the franchise. And out of the three movies, The Last Jedi gave him his biggest role. To say otherwise is to say that you're watching a different movie. Now, it doesn't mean you have to like the adventure that Rose and Finn went on. Okay? But it is to say that that was the story and it was his biggest role. And about Canto Bite and his attitude. I know people have had a hard time with this. He was always a stormtrooper. He would have been blown away and just wide-eyed and shocked being inside the casino. It probably was one of the first moments that he'd ever have of being in a place that luxurious around people like that before. Remember the second movie, The Last Jedi, picked up right after The Force Awakens did, and it was only at the start of The Force Awakens when he was no longer a stormtrooper from birth. And so essentially, he went from stormtrooper to going on this adventure to going to Canto Bight. That was it. The biggest moment in the film, in The Last Jedi, is arguably Snoke, Ray, and Ben on the Supremacy. And it's interspersed with the adventure of Rose and Finn. That whole moment, that amazing moment of, of fighting the Praetorian Guards is broken up because Finn and Rose's story is running in tandem with the main story of the movie. Look, here's my here's my closing comments on this whole thing, and we'll move forward. Uh, in my opinion, he undermined, John Boyega undermined the value of what Finn brought to the sequel trilogy. And in my opinion, it's tainted all the, posit uh, all the positivity and the example of a great heroic, uh, heroic role model by feeding into the anti-Disney Star Wars clickbaiters. Think about it. The same group that actually complained about a black stormtrooper, he now essentially has aligned with in his own negativity about the franchise. Choosing to be an, ad, an an activist instead of an advocate. And that's his choice. And he's entitled to it. But we're also all, we're all entitled to our opinions. And my opinion is he's doing more harm than good in choosing to be an, act, an activist based off an advocate. If it was clear that his character was sidelined in those films, that'd be one thing. But it just isn't. And the numbers and the facts don't bear it out. And I just think it's a bummer. Honestly, I was watching The Rise of Skywalker yesterday, and it bummed me out watching Finn, who I love in The Rise of Skywalker. I love those moments. One of my favorite scenes in the movie over time after watching it so many times is that little quiet moment that Finn and Janna have on the Millennium Falcon while Rey is going into the Death Star 2 on that planet. And that discovery between Janna and Finn that she also was a stormtrooper, and these two are, are connected in this, in this way. You know, knowing the actor wasn't satisfied with his involvement and that he doesn't necessarily approve with the way that his character was portrayed and he felt he was done wrong, that bums me out. I, I just that's a bummer. You know, I you know, I, I just that that's all that that's all that it comes down to, right? And I'm gonna continue to stress this, and I really hope that people listen to what I have to say on here, because I was really trepidatious about going down this road and talking about this, but these are movies that I love and that I'm entertained by. And so when you have an individual who is the co-star of this franchise saying these things about his character, you know, I, I felt the need to sit back and go, look, as a fan, I disagree. 
John Boyega. I think Finn's great. I, I, I think he's a fantastic character. And I think that you, John Boyega, did a great job in portraying him. He's got a definite arc. I had a buddy of mine. Well, the guy I do the, the guy I, I co-host the show with, Drew, he made a comment that he loves the moment and the change that you get in the Rise of Skywalker at the very beginning in that drop sequence that takes place on the frozen asteroid planet. When the after they get the the intel from Bulio and the First Order stormtroopers show up and Poe makes the comment about, hey, Finn, we can boulder these ties. And he goes, I was just thinking that. And you look, and Drew pointed this out to me, the confidence in that quick shot of John Boyega getting in the gunner's chair on the Millennium Falcon and putting the headset on. He just exudes this confidence, man. And it is a complete shift from the character that we saw in The Force Awakens to the character that we saw in The Last Jedi that was annoyed that Rose was enjoying riding on the Fathers on Canto Bite. And then you get this confident character in The Rise of Skywalker who looks at Rey and says, yeah, we're, we're going together. We're going to do this together as a, as a team. It bums me out. It bums me out that the actor has chosen, in my opinion, to be an activist rather than being an advocate. Because I feel like there is a lot more that could have been gained by being more positive about that character. And being open and honest with your opinion is a choice too. And I have to, and, and and I need to say that as well. He made a choice to go and disparage the sequel trilogy based off of his own experience, and he's entitled to do that. But he made the choice to do that. You know, I'm sure there are plenty of other actors and actresses out there that could also do the same thing, but perhaps see value in, well, I don't want to really want to disparage this character because it was a moment of positivity for a lot of people out there. And if the evidence on screen had bared out in what he said, that this character was sidelined, I would agree with him. But in my opinion, I'll say it again, it's just not the case. Even beyond a subjective standpoint, you can subjectively not like the way the character was written, but that's on the that's on the creators. But isn't it, it, it again, isn't it interesting now that the very people that he was pushing back against and he's on social media complaining about the fandom and has done so more than any of the other character uh, any of the other cast members. And yet all he's doing is feeding the same type of negativity towards the franchise and buying into the same type of stereotypical arguments that other have, others have made. And those are the individuals that push back on his character. I just, that's a bummer, man. Just an absolute bummer. I just, that's all that it is. Talkshownerd at gmail.com if you want to drop an email address. If you want to drop an email to me, I just gave you the email address. Uh, this portion of the show is brought to you by Zone. One million users united with one mission to take back social media. And with your help, Zone's going to take billions away from today's social media giants and give it back to you, the user. Look, I'm concerned about the increasing amount of censorship coming from social media companies, and that's why I'm a part of Zone. It's a brand new social media outlet that's launching very soon, coming up actually in October, I believe. To become a Zone ambassador, you can, and it's free, right, for a limited time, and you'll get increased influence as well as a variety of other advantages. And what Zone is is revolutionary. It's a better all-in-one social media alternative. It eliminates the need for the social media giants. With one profile, you can control multiple zones using different avatars that suit your online persona needs. And Zone is all user-owned. Anyone can invest to own more of the Zone platform. And at very little cost, but again, do not wait. Zone's claimed first or will have more influence. Zone does launch soon. So join me and claim your Zone today at OurZone.Zone. Again, that's O-U-R Zone dot Zone. When I found you, I saw raw, untamed power. And beyond that, something truly special. All right, just an interesting observation that's been making the rounds over the course of the past week. This version comes from MovieWeb. A much-overlooked Obi-Wan Kenobi death detail in A New Hope has suddenly been discovered 
by new Star Wars fans. It's been over 40 years since the original movie first hit theaters, and people are still finding new aspects of the story to pour over. George Lucas and crew had no idea that they were about to change the course of sci-fi forever when they were working on the first chapter in the space opera. Lucas just wanted to complete A New Hope after a series of setbacks had plagued the project. In A New Hope, Alec Guinness plays Obi-Wan Kenobi. He helped Luke Skywalker on his mission, ultimately sacrifices himself so Luke, Han, Leia, and Chewie could escape. It's an iconic scene that's been looked at under a microscope for the past 40 years. It has even been reimagined by Star Wars fans with even better lightsaber fighting. No argument there. That clip is awesome. However, some fans have picked up a subtle new detail. One fan asked, do you ever think about how the last thing Obi-Wan sees is Luke and Leia, finally reunited after 19 years? Technically, that is the last thing that Obi-Wan Kenobi sees. Through time and other installments, we know more about Obi-Wan and his mission, so this would have been his goal. However, it is believed that not even George Lucas knew that Darth Vader was going to be Luke Skywalker's father and Leia Organa at this time. Right, the father of Luke Skywalker and Leia Organa at this time. Spoiler alert. This new detail seems to be a happy accident that works really well with the rest of the saga, though it works within the context of A New Hope without having to know all of the backstory that later came that uh, that came later too. Obi Wan had succeeded, and he knew it. It's pretty amazing to think that the most of the Star Wars franchise has branched off of just one single movie. George Lucas set the template in the original trilogy, and every ever since. Uh, everything has been built off of that, including the prequels that came afterwards, and now the world of Star Wars is big and vast, with a ton of stories, all based on that original 1977 movie, which fans are still, for the most part, enjoying, especially when it comes to The Mandalorian. Plus, there's the new Obi-Wan Kenobi Disney Plus series on the way to look forward to. Ewan McGregor is reprising his role as the Jedi Master in the series, which is set to begin production soon. The project has been in development for many years now, which was originally going to be a movie. However, Lucasfilm decided to make it a limited series, which will give us even more details into the history of Obi-Wan Kenobi and might even tie in the newly spotted detail from A New Hope that fans are currently talking about. So that's pretty interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. I had a buddy of mine. Uh, commie Bob, not because he's a commie, because he dressed like one. Um, I used to work with him in, in Tucson. Great guy. But he texted me out of the blue the other day, and it was a meme of this very thing. And it was something I was like, whoa, I myself had not even considered that. I thought it was really interesting and a little bit more lighthearted based off of the entirety of um, the first part of the podcast this week. All right, with that, let's dive into... Some listener feedback, after which I will tell you about the brand new contest we have going on, your chance to pick up free stuff, and a lot of opportunities to pick up free stuff, too. I need someone to show me my place in all this. All right, we got quite a few emails this week, and so we'll start off with friend of the show, also fellow podcaster, Brendan Marr. Hey, John, simple question this week. What was the moment in the Star Wars film saga where you realized that this was more than just a film but something seismic? Well, there's two, actually. The first one was seeing A New Hope in 1977 in Rosemead, California, with my father as a five-year-old. And I still remember the look of the theater. Whether or not that memory is true or not, I have a vision in my head of that theater. And I remember those TIE fighters and X-Wing fighters on the Death Star flying into the trench. Um, For whatever reason, that... Well, I mean, look, not for whatever reason. It was iconic. But that was one of those moments where I knew that I was watching something really special. When I really, truly did that this was more than just a film, it came the first time that I saw The Empire Strikes Back. And it came with The Empire Strikes Back in the moment when Luke is on Dagobah and he goes in to face his biggest fear in the, in, in the tree, in the temple, right? Um, and we get that abstract, slow-motion vision battle between Luke and Darth Vader where he, you know decapitates him and then the mask blows up and we see Luke's face as a kid seeing that back in the early 80s you know being what seven years old seven eight years old at the time I remember going whoa because I hadn't ever seen anything like that where I didn't know exactly what I was watching but yet it still struck me and hit me in a way that I had not you know I had I had not anticipated it was in that moment even as a kid that I knew okay 
this is this is something this is something different here. It's got cool ships and it's got cool characters and talking little frog dudes and lightsabers and all that. But now we've got this deep dark weirdness, and I'm not used to this. This is something foreign to me. That's when I knew that Star Wars was was something special. Thank you so much for the uh, for the email, uh, Brendan. I appreciate it. I appreciate your show too. It's good stuff. Friend of the show, Miranda Alicia writes this. So random, but you know what often does not get talked about enough is Ray's kindness and compassion and why I believe it's one of her most strongest characteristics. It's one of the things that I absolutely adore about The Rise of Skywalker. And I think, you know, after going through and looking at the run times of the characters from the films and looking at that 55 minutes that Ray dominates the screen time almost 56 minutes of that film i think that's why i love that movie so much i love her character it's it's my favorite ray ray skywalker in the rise of skywalker is hands down my favorite character in the franchise and favorite portrayal i love her in that movie and one of the reasons why miranda is what you just said her kindness and compassion in the moments that it shows and how that plays into her frustration her anger and her fear it's just done brilliant brilliantly and i really do believe personally that the rise of skywalker takes the best of what jj abrams do, does and combined it with the the brave storytelling that ryan johnson did in the last jedi i feel like we would never have gotten the rise of skywalker without the last jedi and we wouldn't have gotten either of them without the force awakens that's just the bottom line and The Rise of Skywalker is so great because of what came before it with The Last Jedi. And even J.J. Abrams himself said that he was motivated to take some risks with The Rise of Skywalker because of what Ryan Johnson did. So yeah, Miranda, I totally agree with you. All right, friend of the show, Brian Martin, writes this. How does Ray knowing Wookiee make sense for a skill for Ray to have? Think about it. Chronologically, how many Wookiees other than Chewie have, be- have we seen since the Battle of Kashyyyk? There are some in Solo and Rebels, but there's none in the original trilogy and none in the sequels either. So why would Rey learn to speak Wookiee? We can say where. We we can say where because she hasn't left Jakku, but we didn't see any Wookiees on Jakku. This is not a skill that makes sense for her to have, is it? Um my answer to that is I believe it was answered it was answered in some ancillary material. It's the same reason that she can understand droid. She was reading a lot of material on Jakku that gave her these skills. She had all those years, which was highlighted in the markings that she had on the sheet of metal inside her downed AT-AT home that she'd been there for obviously, you know, over, over a decade. And she'd been training herself in reading manuals. We know that's why she was already a skilled pilot because she actually worked in the simulator. And I believe that she self-taught herself how to do all these things. Understanding Wookiee, and also understanding droid. Plus, it just play it just plays better with the plot, right? It's an easy explanation and and something and the kind of thing that I don't necessarily personally get hung up on. I'm just sort of willing to accept that oh, she taught herself how to speak Wookiee, and that works well for the story. Brian Martin, as always, thank you so much for the email. Thomas Coster writes this. Um, listening to your post show, this was on the on the on the regular show that I do, which you can hear on the iHeartRadio app, Justice and Drew. Uh, catching up with your blog, you posted about your Star Wars poster find. So I went out. I was on vacation, uh, not this past week, but the week before. And there's a little town called Anoka that's um, about 10 minutes from here. Beautiful little town. I dig it there. And they have these antique shops. And we went there about a year ago. And I found some pretty cool Star Wars finds. They're consignment antique shops. People go in there and they rent out cabinets to go and sell stuff, right? Um, and so uh, within... My shopping, I wasn't finding anything. They didn't have anything new. But I walked into one particular store, and as I walked in, I'm looking around. The guy says, can I help you find anything? And I was like, well, you know, I'm just looking for Star Wars stuff. He's like, yeah, I don't really have a lot right now, but I do have this poster. And I was like, all right, what poster? Thinking this is just going to be, you know, garbage. I'm not even that garbage, but just a poster that I've seen before, right? And I walk into the separate room, and up on the wall framed in this is this original It's not in the perfect shape, but it's under glass in a frame, 1977, original Star Wars promotional poster done by artist John Berkey. Now, for those that are not familiar with artist John John Berkey, he did some of the original artwork for A New Hope. And it's artwork that you don't see used anymore. It's very abstract, very rudimentary in terms of the 
design of Y wings and 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 X wing fighters and the Death Star. It doesn't even look like what ends up on screen. His art was primarily used for the novels, but it was also used in some early promotional work. I have a my shower curtain in my bathroom is actually John uh, Berkey's work. And this was a promotional poster for the film that was put out in 1977. And it's one of the only John Berkey posters that I'd ever seen that was used for actual promotion of the movie. If you want to take a look at it, go to MyNerdWorld.net. Go to the My Nerd blog and look back um, a couple of blogs from last week and you'll find the poster in there. In 1977, Thomas goes on to say, I bought the Star Wars double album uh, vinyl and it included the same poster. I still have the vinyl and the poster. As a geeky kid in school, I remember blasting the Star Wars theme music while viewing the poster. As a dog lover, I can fully understand your experience talking about my dog now. Heartfelt condolences to you and your family. Um, really enjoying book one. Should finish reading it today. The characters and events are easy to picture in my mind and follow from your attention to detail and backstory. So... I uh, wanted to share that particular email with you. Thank you so much, Thomas, for the comments about the book as well. Uh, and the poster, buying the vinyl double album for Star Wars. I remember what a big deal that was, and it included that particular poster, although I believed it was a smaller uh, version of it. I just personally love John Berkey's work and was so stoked to end up to uh, to have found that particular poster. All right, next we go to friend of the show, Gen G, who writes this. Congratulations to the winners. That was for the... Uh, for the autographed books. One day before he gets big, <laughs> that's funny, I will get John to sign one of my copies. Um, By the way, um, to that, Gen G or anybody else, if you have purchased paperbacks of Embark, um, if you email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, uh, I will give you the address. If you send them to me, I will sign your books and ship them back to you free of charge. You just have to pay for the shipping going to me. So if anybody wants their book signs, if you purchase them, or if you purchase books, I can tell you, or you're going to purchase paperbacks, I can tell you where to ship them. But if you already have your paperbacks, um, email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. I'll tell you where to mail them to. I'll sign them and turn them around that same that same week uh, and uh, pay for the shipping for you. How's that sound? All right. Um, as for the, this week in the fandom, I saw on your Twitter rumors of a Soka clip for the Mando 2 trailer, and I was... Uh, looking at the negative comments to it. And not that she was going to be in it, but about how she would be shown in the trailer and how the trailer has not even aired. Wow, preconceived notions of the trailer in their head. It's beyond ridiculous. Anyway, I'm still here hoping for anything Star Wars. Uh, have a great week uh, back at work. May the Force be with you. Thank you, Gen G. I appreciate that. All right, uh, moving on. We go to uh, Mike Rotunda in response to my conversation um, on the podcast about the DC fandom and how successful it was. He just writes this, Star Wars is dead, all exclamation point, all capital letters, exclamation point. It's DC time now. Okay. I don't think that's necessarily true, and I think he was being silly. Like, the Jedi are dead, which is one of my favorite little moments from The Rise of Skywalker. But either way, thanks for the email there, Mike. I appreciate it. Uh, Jennifer Oliver writes, uh, thanks, John, for the show today. I uh, can't believe you're currently on the fifth book in the series. Really love the characters and settings you write about. Take care. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I uh, I appreciate your comments as well. Talkshownerd at gmail.com. That's the email address. If you want to write me, if you want to tell me how I'm totally wrong about John Boyega and that wasn't fair, you can do that. Um, I would like to get your thoughts, though. Uh, again, I, I, I was really hesitant to talk about it on the show, but... I'm such a fan of this franchise, um, and if you've been listening to the show for any length of time, you know I just I like to be honest about my feelings, and it's a bummer. It's a bummer that he had an experience that way, and then again, it's a bummer if you're a fan of the Finn character to know that the apparent actor you know, had such a hard time with it. That's disappointing. All right, before we wrap up, there's a brand new contest available at MyNerdWorld.net. Join the MyNerdWorld mailing list. If you're already on there, you can still take part in the contest. No spamming or sharing of your information ever. If you join the mailing list, and you'll be registered to win free Embark audiobooks narrated by the author, John Justice. Hey, that's me. So the grand prize goes like this. The grand prize will be the complete Embark trilogy in audiobook. That's book one, The Great Evacuation, Treasure in Darkness, uh, and The Vanishing War audiobooks. The second place prizes, of which there will be four winners, will receive um, books one and two. Right, in The Great Evacuation and Treasure and Darkness and audiobooks. And then third place, of which there will be five winners, 
we'll get Embark Book One, The Great Evacuation, in audiobook. So in all, we've got 10 winners. One will get the complete trilogy. Four will get books one and two. And five are going to get book one. All you have to do is go to MyNerdWorld.net and hit the contest page. There's a link right on the homepage. So go to MyNerdWorld.net, right on the homepage, in green, there's a link. You simply enter your information in the form and write Embark Giveaway for your chance to win. The drawing's going to take place in two weeks on September 19th on the A Star Wars Podcast right here. Listening is not required to win. Winners will be emailed their free codes after the drawing. And remember, you can get the entire trilogy in ebook, paperback, and audiobook at Amazon right now. All the details are available at mynerdworld.net. Uh, and that is how you can support the show. Right now, the ebooks are priced at $2.99 for book one and $4.99 for books one and two. Uh, the paperbacks are thirteen ninety nine, And then the audiobook price varies but, uh, whether or not uh, you've purchased an, uh, an ebook. I really hope that you enjoyed uh, the show this week. I hope it wasn't too negative in my commentary. And I really look forward to hearing uh, from you um, for next week's show. Uh, Hopefully we've got some more Star Wars stuff to talk about, like a Mandalorian trailer. That would be amazing. Until then, have yourself a great week. May the Force be with you. And uh, head on over to MyNerdWorld.net and support uh, My Nerd World, a Star Wars podcast, and pick yourself up a copy of the Embark trilogy. Uh, Talk to you next week. Bye. The Force will be with you, always. My Nerd World.